And she said, I, I was so happy when I came over that it scared me because I thought I should feel a little sadness about leaving the earth plane. She said, but I was so free from pain and it was so beautiful over here and so many incredible beings were, were here. She said, I had a crowd. It was not a small group that, that greeted me. And that really kind of uh, floored me, she said, because I didn't expect so many to be here. And she said, I had family and I had dear friends and I, I just can't wait to talk about my dear friends that were over here reading me, helping me know the ropes. But she said it was like I, she said it was like I had never left here. Welcome to Soul Explorers. With your host, Gary Langley and Sally Taylor. Well, this was certainly an e-ticket ride, this interview. It went on for a long time, and many notable people came through. Uh, we had people such as Robin Williams, uh, Olivia Newton-John. We had Carl Sagan. We had Anthony Bourdain. We had Emanuel Swedenborg. I mean, the list goes on. Um, one thing I found extremely interesting was both Sally and I got little nods from some of the people that communicated during this interview. The first one I got was the night of the interview. I turned the news on, have not seen this commercial before or since. And it was for a flea and tick treatment for animals, for dogs. And the background music was, you're the one that I want, which was Olivia Newton-John and John Travolta. And I just kind of thought, well, that was interesting. A little later in the week, I received an email from Amazon. Now you may say algorithms, but let me explain. The email said items we think you might like. And there were two wall hangings with quotes from Anthony Bourdain. I have never ordered anything cooking oriented, cookbooks, anything, cooking, you know, hardware, any of that stuff. So I thought, now that's interesting. And Sally, you had a couple of experiences. So I did also the first night right after the interview. Uh, you'll see a little bit at the very end of the second half of this interview, Gene uh, talks about a rubber band ball. And the only TV show I watched <laughs> after that night uh, the main character was playing with a rubber band ball. And so again, I just thought, oh, that's interesting. And But then a couple of days later, I was uh, checking my Facebook page and a an entry that someone else had posted about Carl Sagan popped up, including his view on God, which was really interesting because that's a major part of uh, this interview as well. Um, so yeah, uh, some fun synchronicities yes. around our guest that showed up for this interview. I do wanna mention also really quickly, I'll apologize for the technical issues that you will notice in this interview. Uh, Jean's video was breaking up quite a bit. We do know that Spirit plays with technology, so I'm blaming it on them, <laughs> but, uh, as long as her voice was clear, I have kept it in this final cut. Um, but you will notice that her video freezes quite a bit. So please excuse that, but listen to the content because it's amazing. And I want to add that um, the characters that came through are notable characters. You'll recognize most of them. Sometimes they were very much themselves. The language that they used might be considered a little off color by some, does not present a problem to me or Sally, but just if your kids are watching, you may hear a few words that you don't want them to hear. Welcome to Soul Explorers. We're your hosts, Sally Taylor. My name is Gary Langley, and today we have our returning friends, Regina Ochoa and Jeannie Love, uh, mediums extraordinaire. Welcome to the show, ladies. 
Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's wonderful. Of course. <laughs> We're excited. As are we. <laughs> I mean, you're back so soon because we just had such a great time with you on our first visit. And um, it seems there's more to say and more to do. It was a party. It's our second date. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and we're trying an experiment today. Um, something a little different than our show usually is formatted as. But we're going to be talking to some people on the other side through these two wonderful mediums. So maybe uh, either Regina or Jean, if you could tell us a little bit about what we can expect to transpire. We actually, Jean and I, not sure what to expect. This is um, the biggest thing is we have to open ourselves to the unexpected and to follow the lead and trust and have a tremendous amount of belief and faith that they have our back uh, and the spirits have our back. And initially we were given eight entities who would like to share their information. And uh, one of them will be the MC and he's getting his gear on right now. We're gonna have six speakers and the MC at this point, I think, right Jeannie? Six? Yeah, yeah, okay. and. Um, one of my speakers, my, my uh, seventh one, had to uh, step away uh, as much as he had some really fabulous information and was really excited to share. Um, he and I had a very soul-to-soul -soul conversation with the fact that um, sometimes uh, the earth isn't quite ready because there is a political climate that may cause disinterest, distrust, and disbelief. And he really had some incredible information to share, but he, I've asked him to come through through automatic writing and we'll do it that way. So we're down to three on my side, three on Jean's side and the MC. And I would like to introduce our MC who is standing by and just anxiously tapping his foot to get in and have me shut up. And his name is Robin Williams. Welcome, Robin. <laughs> We're thrilled you joined us yet again. <laughs> I'm hearing this comments in the background. All right, there, he's going to go for it. They are throwing something out to lighten the whole area. And it's also, <laughs> this, 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 this was supposed to be to go to Jean, but they're giving it to me. And Robin is supposed to answer this. So, they are throwing this thing out saying, Robin, Robin, tell them what sex is like on this side. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going, I got this. I got this really well. <laughs> it's plentiful. It's plentiful <laughs> because he's saying that in on the earthly plane, it, you know, sex comes with orgasms. You know, and uh, that's what we think of as opposed to sexual. And because it comes with the physical. And he says, we don't have a physical here. So it's, life is orgasmic. It's constant. It's absolutely a constant thing. And the biggest part about being in orgasmic state, he's saying, and I don't know if you're going to have to edit all this out because of the word, but who cares? Um, he says, fuck that. <laughs> Shame on you. Anyway, you think that it's because when we're in the physical state, we have to constantly be in a state of, of um, preparedness and defense for our own survival of our body. And so when we have these orgasms, we are in a complete state of vulnerability at that moment. And as a human, and he said, but on the other side, there is no vulnerability because we're, there is no fear. There's only love. There's just a constant state of love. So that vulnerability is gone that you have to have in your process of being human and having a sexual encounter. So in our side, he's saying, it's, it's there all the time. And that feeling of heightened sensitivity and awareness where everything is brilliant is constant. 
it is absolutely constant. There is always a surprise. And there's no fear ever. And no feeling of needing to be protected or safe or scared. It's just a wondrous door, one door opening another. And it's, it's, it's fabulous. So do we have quote unquote sex on the other side? We don't need it. It's not that, that's the human nature of it. But he says, we get that question all the time. What's it like? Fantastic. I understand that there is a, a sense of blending with another that you're really close to. And I'm saying this for Robin's sake. Do you have to take them out to dinner first? No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. And if you're asking the question, if uh, spirits actually come to back to visit in the earth plane and have these experiences with a, a physical partner, absolutely. Yeah. And people have these experiences and want to share those and don't. It happens more often than we know. Um, he's saying it's very normal. It's very common. And it's more for the person, the physical person. And, and sometimes he's saying in the awareness of it all, there are entities that do not leave who really need to be on the other side who are trespassing who really are trespassing. And so uh, that's part of uh, what Jean was talking about, about bringing yourself into a shield. Whenever you do anything, but whether you're sleeping or not, we put ourselves into a protective space of love. So then nobody else can enter in and step inside your private space. These are invitations only, invitations only. And it's by consent. Absolutely, 100% must be consensual. If it's not, they don't belong. Get throw that spirit out. I hate to bring that as a downer now. Dang. <laughs> Is Carrie there? Oh yeah, but it's Olivia that I've really it's been feeling Olivia? all morning. Yeah, I've been singing with her all morning. I turned her music on and she really wants to talk. <laughs> Let her in. Let her in. <laughs> and she's she's just been pushing her elbows in with the push her way through the men and she goes, I've got this. She goes, let me tell you more about sex on this side. <laughs> and then she goes, because I was seen as a, you know, a sex symbol in some ways. And I was groomed that way by the industry. I was this pretty little blonde thing, you know, and I had this sexy little Australian accent. And she said, and I got so tired of that. I got so tired of being pigeonholed into that. And then Robin has, we've been conversing, of course, and he said he got very tired of being just the crazy maniac uh, com uh, comedian, you know, and wanted to be thought of as a serious person. And he, she says that's why he came in kind of seriously this morning, because he's not just always fun and games and uh, the entertainer, although he doesn't mind doing that. But so we're we're coming at it from that point of view of our experiences once we were over. And and. She goes, I just love being here. She said, it was very hard for me to leave my body. I tried to stay as long as I could. I used as many alternatives as I did regular kinds of, of uh, treatments for the cancer that was just so present through all of my body. And she said, I really was trying to be more of a martyr than I needed to be. I didn't realize I didn't need to be a martyr. But, you know, I was just going to stick it through because I, I couldn't stand leaving my daughter and my husband and and just you know wasn't ready yet but she said um it got to the point where i i had no choice but to surrender and uh one of the songs that i wanted gene to, to play with me this morning was um you know from xanadu my great hit movie uh about um you have to believe your magic and and i want gene and and all of you to feel that you 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 are magic and she said, I, I was so happy when I came over that it scared me because I thought I should feel a little sadness about leaving the earth plane. She said, but I was so free from pain and it was so beautiful over here and so many incredible beings were, were here. She said, I had a crowd. It was not a small group that, that greeted me. And that really kind of uh, floored me, she said, because I didn't expect so many to be here. And she said, I had family and I had dear friends. And I, I just can't wait to talk about my dear friends that were over here. 
reading me, helping me know the ropes. But she said it was like I, she said it was like I had never left here. Olivia says it was like I, I always had one foot in this plane of consciousness, like I never left. And and I was so, so present after, after the passing was so difficult. She said, I, I would just, you know, I was blown away, but I was ecstatic. And she said, I still am. I'm, I'm, I'm the joy buzz around Jean sometimes when I get her to sing because she has this gorgeous voice. She never uses it. And so when she does use it, we're, we're, we're giddy and we dance around and sing. And I said, a oh, wonderful friendship with somebody that I know, but didn't know in the physical this lifetime around, but I've known her. And that's why I was so comfortable and couldn't wait to finally come through and, and make my presence known. And she said, if I could come in full body, I'd even bring in more of myself for her to to resonate for you guys. But I respect Jean's boundaries because this is all that she can do right now. And, and I'm very grateful for that. She said, but let me talk you, to you about merging and, and, and mingling. And she said, I experienced that when I was on stage. She said, because um, she had, she really believed in all this stuff. And, and Olivia said, I don't know how I would have done without it because she said, I had some personal tragedies and then I'd have to go on and perform on stage and I didn't know how I was going to get through it. But I was very close to Karen Carpenter and I would just pray and I could feel her presence there helping me through my performance. And she was one of the first people that I got, got to see again. I was so happy to see her because I was always so sad about the circumstances surrounding her passing. And there she was, vibrant full voice, brought her drum set to entertain me. She said, I haven't pulled this drum set out for a very long period of time, but for you, you get the full, you know, hurrah and shebang. And so it, it was just, it was beautiful. It wasn't, it was so easy. Um, she said, and of course, now what am I doing? I've, I've really been learning how to go between worlds and to move between where I prefer to stay and go in then to see my family and, and my friends. And because they knew that I would come to them. And and so they kind of were hoping, you know, would we leave a little message just before I passed about how I thought I would appear? But it's like you asking questions. Uh, it never works that way. Did, did you want to ask me something, Mr. Handsome Man? Oh, well, thank you. It, it's not every day you get called handsome by Olivia Newton-John. So you <laughs> made my day. Um, yeah, there was a wonderful little article shortly after your your transition, where you had said to your daughter, I'm going to come back as one of those orb thingies. And now both your daughter and your husband have caught a blue orb in photographs, and they believe that to be you. Is that you? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Good My <job>. favorite color. <laughs> absolutely. I won't be denied. You know, you can't stay in show business without having a really strong personality and even though I might not have come across as as um you know a, a Brunhilde I still had that inside of me otherwise it would not have survived everything and I wouldn't have survived the cancer as long as I did and there's nothing going to stop me from communicating with those people I love the most and Robin would come with me and JD would come with me that's John Denver and then uh, my sister would come with me because she passed before and and we'd have fun going into people's homes and just seeing if they would start talking about us because that's the best way to know that someone is sensitive and all of a sudden you know they're having a discussion and then they go you know I, I was listening to that music by so-and-so the other day and oh that was just really interesting and I really miss that person and of course we're right there standing in their living room or their you know library wherever we are and then we've got successful the reason being is that when we come in like what Gina was saying it's with love it's it's coming in with pure love and, and holding that love around them. We don't mind not being um, up on the uh, the marquee. We don't have to have people know that that's who is coming in. We just love the fact that we can go in and have a positive influence, especially if somebody's struggling or uh, having problems. You know, it's 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 just wonderful to be able to know we have a positive effect. And you know, if the whole world could understand that. It would just be so different. Unfortunately, they do know it to some degree. Those who are, are practicing, you know, bad habits, dark magic, uh, control systems. And it, it's just uh, it's just really it's just really a shame. But we, we love to do that. 
that. That's why we're still around. We know that we're that we're eternal beings. We know that we can go, you know, further and farther into the greater reality. I mean, absolutely. But right now, these parts of us are choosing to stay here and have some kind of uh, impact on those around us, so that they can feel like, don't give up. You know, keep going on, keep going on. Anyway, I could talk all, all day, but I I just wanted to come in and. And is, is that astronauts call it a VPI, voice print identification, to have said I had the Gene Love experience. And then I'll, at some other point in time, I'll have the Regina Ochoa experience. But it, it's hard to explain what it's like through this room medium because they hear us so easily that it's like we're sitting with them in a room and we're speaking one language and they're translating it. it it's unbelievable how how clear it is. You know, uh, I, I can't explain it but it's just fabulous. And do we have this constant state of euphoria over here? If we want to, we can. And and when and Mr. Langley, you talked about merging. And she said, I was a little afraid to to look at what that meant. But then Robin was eager to show me how easy it was and it wasn't going to be, I wasn't being defiled or anything. And so he would embrace me with his energy and you could just feel it. But I also had the same experiences with Kelly Preston, John Travolta's wife who passed, who never wants to be public, but she likes to be around us that are communicating. And I was so glad to see Kelly again because, you know, we were we were a threesome in some ways. And of course, Kirstie Alley is over and that's a trip. But anyway, Kelly and I learned, we, we, we really shared energy in a way that you, you only feel like once in a while in your lifetime. And then it wasn't even as close as it could be because there's nothing in the way, as, as Robin said, there's nothing in the way, but your essence. And that doesn't mean that your essence is always pure, but when you've had these experience with people who've been over and have really learned how to um, contain themselves in a, in a really strong fashion of energy, and they know their energy essence and their, and, and they know how to follow it and work with it. It, it is just beyond anything it, that I've ever experienced in the human form. I've, I have wonderful friends over here. I have wonderful friends that are not necessarily well known to any of you and family members. So I'm so delighted to see some of my animals and pets that I've missed. It's more real than, than this. And I'm happy, I'm ecstatic, ecstatic. And I just told the man that he was gonna have to let me come in first because it was woman's turn, you know. So anyway. Well, I want to thank you personally for being such a bright light in this world Absolutely. and now from beyond this world. So thank Absolutely. you for, for your glorious light that you shine. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of love. And she actually too. answered a question that I was going to ask, which was whether or not she had a belief in the afterlife before she transitioned. And it sounds like she absolutely did and had those conversations with her family. And that was stated in the article that I was it. Yes, yeah. she she had talked to her daughter about it a lot and they would watch shows that were sort of along that theme. And she said, I'm going to come back as one of those orb thingies. That was the quote, orb thingies. And, <laughs> and then her daughter snapped, accidentally snapped um, a picture of the dog with her phone and there's a blue orb. And then her husband was at, I'm not sure if it was a funeral or some event and a picture was taken and he had a blue orb right in front of his face. Apparently that was her. Oh, she's very present. And, um, She's having to she's having to really stop talking because she knew there's other people that need to get through. But she, when they the first time they have this experience of knowing they can communicate this way, they don't want to leave. They don't want to leave. But she's she's she is a lovely, lovely energy. Oh, and oh. Um, I uh, when she 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 wrote a whole article through me when she first went over and I asked her recently because we're updating more things to cosmic voices I asked her if she wanted to have that on there and she goes no it's really personal and wise it was very detailed and i said but she said i want to write for cosmic voices so you know i will but i want a, a new writing and i said absolutely so yeah she's just a lovely energy she's light she's effervescent but she's 
she's very aware. I mean, she's not clueless. She's not, you know, some, she's just. Oh, no. <laughs> Never very, saw it. It's that. Very aware. Yeah. Very aware. Yeah. And I have had an eternal crush on her. <laughs> That's why she said, you know, such a handsome man, and she calls you Mr. Langley. She re <laughs> respects Thanks. you because she's seen what the kind of work that you've done. They see a lot, you know, they and they research, you know, mm -hmm. they, especially if they're going to come through, they want to know who they're, you know, touching base with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to the next person here. And she's, she's, she's pushing Olivia out. Okay. She says, okay. <laughs> this is Casey Kalpana. Chala from the Columbia disaster. And I hate introducing myself for that way, but it's just simply the way it is. Um, I'm coming here because Olivia and Robin were speaking of the similar and dissimilar lines of thought with sex going into merging and that bringing into what I need to speak to you about and to your audience. And that is about courting and how we merge and become corded to another individual on the other side or stay corded within your own family units. When we have our children, I, I'm without children, but I can see the, well, let me put it this way. I can see the cord between you and your son, Sally. And I wanted you to know that it's, it's incredibly strong. It's a bright white cord. I'm going to keep her eyes closed this whole time, just so you know, so that she isn't distracted by by her hand movements or everything on the screen but she uh, i'm i'm here more than she's listening to me so i'm going to just speak here for you for and so the courting is really between you and your son is incredibly bright white it's almost umbilical like and because where you were doing life force when you carried him, he's now part of your life force in the wake of walking life. So your roles have reversed and that's the cord's job to keep that nutrition, nutrition, that love sense, that all the other energy and experience that you are beginning to have, he's, he's handing it to you. He's feeding you. He's incredibly increasing your own abilities to experience more than what most of people around you are experiencing. And that is due to your son's gifts. He's courting with you. Now merging is similar, but it's not quite merging. We come in and out. We come in and out and we meet up with each other's energies and we engage and we can physically engage with the person and we can spiritually engage with each other. And again, this, like Robin was saying, this is all consent basis. We have to be invited. We have to be invited. And then before we enter into another person's space, we have to make sure it's safe for them because not everybody can handle the energy that comes from the other side, as they say. I'm sharing this courting because as a unit, the four of you now have courted. You've intertwined to the other side. You've created your own bridge and are now receiving, all of you are receiving information simultaneously. You may not be hearing it or, or able to see it or feel it experienced. You will be noticing it over the next two or three weeks. You know, some things will be starting to shake inside you and you're going to just feel like a little tingling and like a thirst or I need a little bit more. That's the courting because you've asked us permission to cord with you and we will stay here with you. And when you no longer need us in your field of energy, just ask us to step back and we disengage. We pull these things apart. But we're here for a very important reason. We've chosen to stay closer to the earth plane, not because we don't wanna move away, but because there are so many incredible individuals here who are still requesting this, this, what we can give, our love to them from this side. When I died, I had no problem separating from my body. Absolutely none. It was the most thrilling portion of my life was the next start of it. 
knowing instantly that I was engaged with my family back in Karna and seeing the hustle and bustle of life on the streets of India. And I've quickly visited my colleges and the universities. And then I was back over in NASA and I was with my husband, JP. And he and I, we merge, but we are courted. And he has continued to protect our personal energy and space. And for that, I'm really, really grateful. But again, courting, merging, the beauty of having ultimate love and light and that experience of engagement, we are just as thrilled on this side. We are just as excited when we're invited to share what we have to offer with you. And so when Jean talks about the fact that, oh, they're all crowded inside, we're, they're busy, we're packed up, we're loaded for bear, all those other experiences and, and sounds, those girls are weighted down. They actually gain physical weight when we're all with them because we're feeding them. We're just feeding them loads of information. And it's not a physical, visual uh, weighted thing, but they can get on a scale and gain three or four pounds just when they carry us. And then by the time this is done, we'll all be gone again. Oh, that's so beautiful. Well, it, it's important for you to recognize also, I'm sharing all this information because when a person has requested our presence, whether that we're in our ho their house or in their body as a channel, they have to physically meet our frequency as we do they. And then we are exchanging. It's like at a table. And we're exchanging the best recipes with each other. And we're just feeding each other. And we're all going, mm, mm, I'll try a little of this, a little of that. This will really take care of it. And it's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. So Kalpana's going to step out now. Thank you, Kalpana. And mm -hmm. we, we you. Said, both Sally and I, I know I speak for her, send you much love. Absolutely. I have Tony Bourdain with me, and uh, he goes, I'm pushing myself in a little further, and I don't care what she says. We have an agreement. Jeannie and I have an agreement. And he says, oh, I really love merging with her, but I'm not going to talk about that today, because that would be a little too much for a podcast. He says, she has a hard time calling me Tony. She likes to call me Anthony, but I really prefer Tony. And um, I first met Jean when these two ladies were up in the San Francisco Bay Area working with that foundation. I don't remember the name of it. And they had this very interesting group of people who were seemingly aware of this kind of communication. And so I got inside and started talking. And I hadn't been over, I don't know, a couple of months maybe and there was all this speculation about how did I kill myself? Did the government kill me? What happened? Was I crazy? And he said, all of it's just bullshit. And every, and every bit of it's true. So there you go. And he said, you know, I've said it. Um, I don't really talk, want to talk in, uh, in public about um, my problems, but I probably eventually will because I'm kind of an open book. And I really like to make things straight. Uh, I've, I've been staying with this organization that these ladies are a part of their own their own group and because they're very healing and they're very supportive and they're very non-judgmental and because I feel like I really I really fucked up I really should have stayed longer than I did I should have found a way to help myself out but I was just so burned out I was so tired and exhausted only because of the choices I made that I had to you know travel around the world which really fed me I had such an incredible journey with all these different places and people seeing the the best in everybody. Sometimes coming back to the United States was a letdown because I'd had so many inspirational stories, so many other places and all my travels and, and, and the, the, the series that I was doing. And he said, but I had a hard time being human. He said, I had a really hard time being human because I came in with this difference in my head 
about who I was. He said, I, you know, I had a really nice family. I didn't, I didn't have a, a horrible life. I had a really nice family, but I, I came in kind of screwed up. He said, but I've been really researching and I'm participating in classes to do the very thing that Jean does with her clients and is to find out about my creation and why I created what I did and what my goals were. And and he said, it's been uh, it's been in, incredibly uplifting and, and challenging because I I'm, I'm found out I'm a very old soul and whatever that means. And, and I came in to challenge myself on all the different incarnations that I came in with were many of them were very challenging and I just loved a good challenge as you know in this lifetime I loved a good challenge and it just was such a part of who I was and who I am and one of the things that I'm working with now is to become softer um, more vulnerable but not in a way of being uh, abused and he said that's a hard thing in, in the human field is to be vulnerable without allowing abuse and whether it's abuse from somebody else or from your own your own self, which usually is part of the case too. He said, and I like Jean so much because she's really a strong bitch of a woman. And, you know, she just does really just doesn't take shit from anybody. And so, you know, I feel like, you know, she will translate me well without, you know, cutting out my swear words and my personality. Because if I'm going to do this, I want people to know, oh, yeah, that's Tony. That, that's his energy. That's his syntax. That's the way he would talk. The only thing I can't get her to do is drink or smoke, but that's okay. She doesn't need that in her in her health system anyway. But um, I have a, I have a really great time because when when she does work with her clients and she's in the group shield that she took you through earlier, I I tend bar and then I'm sometimes a, a sous chef and I prepare meals for them when they come in and we decorate. I have a whole team that decorates the group shield, whether it's Halloween, Christmas, New Year's, uh, Easter bunnies. And and I love it because, you know, when when Robin was in that movie and talked about painting and would paint with his hands. And that was, I think, Alison Anazuko. I mean, I'm with all the right people over here. I mean, they just pulled me in and said, come on, Tony, let us show you what it's really like. And so it was so wonderful to be able to be in this great array of energy beings. Because I didn't think I was going to go into a very good place. I didn't know where I was going to go. And I really didn't think about it because I was is so many people who do take their lives. I just wanted my loneliness and my despair to stop. And we don't think about who we hurt when we leave because we're hurting so much ourselves. And I was just, I was burned out. I was burned out from traveling, you know, two thirds of the year and burned out not seeing my family. At this point, we lost video audio connection with Jean and Anthony. We pick back up with them as our reception improves. Jean's video stays temporarily frozen. Does anybody have any questions? Since you did make a choice to self-exit, did you have any sort of belief system that you would continue on in any way? Yes and no. When I would get into my profound moods, when I would think about the world and the devastation and the destruction and the power struggle and the ugliness of so many. And those profound moments that I, I did have occasionally, I always thought, oh, I hope to God there's something better than this when we die. You know, I, I wasn't really definite about anything specific, but I, I, I was a thinking man and I, and I was a feeler. Honestly, the same most of me didn't really know if there's anything else. And if you ask a lot of people who, to take themselves out, mostly they don't think there's anything, but that's why they do it. They feel like if they don't have their body, they're not going to feel anything anymore. And that's and they're just not going to be. They've just stopped their existence. More questions? Well, I would ask if the, the bulk of humanity knew what you know and, and the others in the group there know about life continuing and being a an ongoing process, wouldn't it have a huge impact on this world? And I also want to add, do you, what is your biggest regret from your lifetime here? In all honesty, Gary, if I may call you Gary. Yes. Um, I have several big regrets. Without going into too many details, but it's a good question. My biggest regret is that I didn't 
calm my ego down enough to get help. Because I had a lot of really incredible friends around me who would have done anything, especially my long-term producer, director of my, you know, my, my show when I'm traveling around. And there could have been things to help me. But when you get into that depressive state, there is no clarity of thought about that. And and for me, I was so despondent that I couldn't even imagine there would be any more help for someone who was toast. That's probably my most immediate regret. I was a compulsive traveler when my career really shifted. I thought, well, this is really good. I've worked really hard and now I have a little extra money and I can treat my wife and my family to better things and, and such. But then there were so many demands on my time and I, and I love to travel, especially everything was so esoteric and eclectic and, and, and huge. I was really regretfully caught between two worlds, my career, and my personal life. And isn't that the same thing a lot of people? I I would try to be home more, but then I would get really restless and I had to go wandering again and needed to go out again. And so none of it really filled me up because I wasn't in peace with the separation. I wasn't able to manage both worlds. And so that would be my, my second regret. The, the third regret I have is how I feel I just disappointed some people. Some people were so disappointed, not just because I couldn't continue the show, but just my real friends and my family members were just so disappointed that I that I didn't have the capacity to stay. And I just really wish I had stayed, but then I wouldn't be able to talk to you beautiful people Thank you. Yeah, we're so grateful for your willingness to come and share your story as challenging as it may be. I, I do have to tell, because I know Jean would tell, but there was this, she yelled at me one day early on when I started to come through her more. And, and my writing is going to be up on Cosmic Voices pretty soon. But one day she was trying to, she's going to cook a steak. And, and she prides herself in her past life when she was younger, being a pretty good cook. And she was using these knives and, and I was just, I was tortured by the way she was using those knives. And I said, why don't you have any good knives in your house? And she goes, these are my good knives. And I thought, oh my God, holy moly, Jesus, Mother Mary. You know, because uh, that was my snobbery coming through. And that's when she really knew it was me. Because she could really feel me just like, no, no, you got to do it this way. You got to do it that way. But, you know, she cooked the best steak that night because she listened to me. And as funny as that might seem or odd as it may seem, it's just a great, it's a great thing to do. You know, when, when Regina talks about, you know, the cords emerging, I mean, there's just to share. Um, it, it's, it's not about taking over. It's just about sharing in another way. And, you know, the friendships that develop. So I, the, yeah, the knife story, um, that was always really funny. He goes, I don't hang out with her anymore when she's cooking. <laughs> Anyway, that's that's enough for me, but I really appreciate. I love your smiling faces. I love beautiful women. I love handsome men. I love people. I love life. I love circumstances. I love stories. And I'm just very pleased and honored to be thought to be important enough to be on this this podcast and to continue maybe to inspire people. Thank I'm you. so grateful for your willingness. Yes. Thank you for your insights too. And uh I, I feel the personality that came across my television screen coming through here. I mean, I feel that very strongly. So let's get back to the interviews because I don't know, you maybe you two can confirm this for me, but I'm getting that uh, Carrie Fisher is biting at the bit. I just wrote her name down. I do a lot of doodling. <laughs> Both of us, yeah. And, and sure. so that's why I'm looking down. I'm just doodling. It helps me relax and stay focused. Carrie wants, uh, I mean, you can tell me if I'm crazy, but Carrie wants Robin to introduce her. <laughs> is that, 
anybody else. Now, yeah. about one and the only, the most brilliant dead person you've ever met in your whole world, the most wonderful alcoholic you could bring to your Thanksgiving table, Miss Carrie Fisher. Yeah, Fisher. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. I really hate <laughs> you right now. <laughs> He's fast and furious. The old broad. <laughs> who basically took her own life because of her drug and alcohol addictions, as Carrie Fisher. And look, <laughs> Jeannie's not wearing her glasses so she can look at bright in the eyes and, the, and, and, and this podcast that's so important to everybody because we're still hogs for the public view. Anyway, it's good to be here. I am so happy to be here. I have no influence on Jane for drinking anything other than water. She doesn't really do coffee anymore. She hasn't smoked for years. She doesn't do alcohol. And she is Miss Prissy about any kinds of drugs. So I don't hang around her because she's fun. I hang around her because I have a lot to learn. And she calms me. But the other thing is, she knows who I am more than I do at times. And let me tell you a little story. So when I was flying back from having completed that series that I was doing, and it was just before Christmas, and I had taken a few things because I really have a fear of flying. And so I was kind of well-oiled and out of it. But then I just, my heart just really had enough of me. And so I went into a thing between cardiac arrest and respiratory arrest and all of a sudden I couldn't breathe. I, I I was really, really ill. And so then I left my body. And when people attended to me, that's a story of six degrees of separation for another time. But anyway, I left my body then I didn't come back. I tried to come back and People were holding me on the other side. I said, no, you don't go back. So they tried to revive me. They got a pulse, but that didn't mean I was there. And, you know, and then they dragged me off the plane and sent me to the hospital and everybody was notified. And of course the media got a hold of it right away. And um, I remember the next thing I, I remember is Jean. And I'm like, who are you? She's sitting where she usually sits doing stuff at her desk. And she uh, was on the computer, so she saw the headline about Carrie Fisher, you know, having some kind of episode and taking to the hospital. And there I am with her, and I'm going, what's going on? And she's like, well, I think you just died. She goes, no, I, I couldn't have just died. And Jean says, yeah, I think you just died. My daughter had a, a similar experience, and she was never able to come back in her body. So, you know, you probably just died. And she goes, but it's Christmas. I love Christmas. Christmas is my favorite thing to do, even though I'm part Jewish. And Jeannie told me, that's why I did it. You love Christmas. You're going to make sure this is going to be a special holiday for all sorts of people for all sorts of reasons. And she's like, oh, Carrie went through some good swearing. And I, I'm interjecting here as Jean now, helped to calm her down. And then we became good friends and I'm going to step out of it and let Carrie tell the story. She goes, well, I'm really glad you're telling the stories. I know Jean is not schizophrenic when she can switch back and forth because it's like two married people that know each other so well and they answer each other's questions. And, uh, and I was very drawn to Jean once I understood what was going on and what was, you know, and I learned about her because her oldest daughter has had serious problems. Um, and, um, in respect to her, I'm not going to go into deep sharing, but there was a lot of things that Jean had gone through herself with, with her oldest child. And so she was very um, loving with me and not judgmental, you know, and I, I found that so comforting because when you live in the public eye, you, you're constantly being judged and the feedback is constant and everybody's telling you. And then you, you start judging yourself and looking at yourself in the mirror and reevaluating this or that. And, and I had a tendency to really downplay some of my talents because I was very self-deprecating. And, you know, that's what alcoholics and drug addicts do. And you're always apologizing or you're always denying or you're always angry. And then when you get in the manic, 
You love it so much. You just love it to pieces and you don't want to see it going away. So, you know, medicating is not always an easy thing. But Jean just really actually kind of saved my life. Well, I've never heard that before. Whew. She said because of her approach to me and, and what was going on. And I just want to publicly thank her for her ability to work with me without being a, a celebrity hog. She has, she has all these celebrities around her, but she they're like friends to her. And, and the same thing with Regina. Uh, we're all part of the same group. You know, groups come in together to do things and we're all part of this group we've committed to to being a, a group of communicators and using using our celebrity status to has, to continue to have some kind of impact to let those who are interested knowing that we never really die uh anton said recently anton yelchin he said there's no afterlife he says it's just other lives you know because you're always alive so there's no afterlife and she said i i hate that he said that because i wish i had said that myself but um I digress. I'm going to come in a little deeper with her. She's very protective of my energy, genius. And um, I'm not quite sure how to handle it sometimes because I just love her like a sister or a mom or, or, or any of that. And um, I just feel, you know, she doesn't like it when I talk about it like that. But anyway, so. I'm going to come in and say some interesting things. And that is that, um, you know, I lived my life like I had my hair on fire. And um, I don't regret it, but I, I would have liked to, to be a little smoother. And when you asked Tony about regrets, I have a lot of them. And so I have been systematically working through them over here since I left. And being kinder to myself is the first thing that I've had to learn how to do and be compassionate. And then to really apologize over and over again to my daughter, because she now has two grandkids. And all I can do is flash around her as orbs. We had a belief system, probably not as well as established as lives, but um, certainly was in place. And we would joke about, you know, haunting each other and, you know, what that would be like. And so I have some communication with Billy, and I'm just really, really grateful. I've calmed down quite a bit, but, I, but I'm but i still very strong-minded and um, have opinions about everything, that's for sure. Anyway, any questions? Yes, Carrie, I wanted to ask you, and because you mentioned this, I think people have a, people on this side of life have a big misconception that when you die and you get, if they believe in the other side, when you get to the other side, you're suddenly different and everything is, you know, you're enlightened, you know it all. My understanding is who you are when you leave here is who you wake up as on the other side. Paramahansa Yogananda says that. Ah. No, you take yourself with you. And she's, I'm so glad you asked. I have gotten into the gurus, but they're not like the gurus that you have in the human world. They're the avatar gurus. But I wanted to find that inspiration over here of being so spiritually high. I really wanted to be high. And, and now I'm learning how to have that high in this field. It's like there's a realm, there's an energy band of the guru avatars. And I spent a lot of time there and also spends a lot of time there. And we have found this inner resolve and wisdom. And that's one of the reasons why we are allowed to, to visit places. I struggled when I first came over. I said, Jean really, really saved my life. She knew what to say. She knew how to help me. And there were others too. But since she's on the show, I'm going to recognize her. But you're you're right. You're right, Gary. I did love your one person show that you did. I saw that video and that was it kept me chuckling. And, you know, seeing the human lifetime drama, yours unfold on the screen. But you did it with such finesse and humor. And uh, everybody should go watch that at some point if you haven't. Well, thank you, Gary. But you realize how much I love your name. 
Why is that? Because my dog, my dog, my therapy dog's name is Gary. Oh. I have an affinity for Gary's. I I needed that because I I because I had blown a lot of my synapses, you know, with all the the stuff I did to myself. Oh. I was like Oscar Levant, like a female Oscar Levant. If anybody knows what he was like, you know, uh, so a lot of people don't know Oscar Levant, but just look it up because he was so medicated and so talented. But man, whoa. And I was kind of like that. Oh, uh, not quite as bad, but, you know, because they, I had a frontal lobotomy and it, man, it was great because they had really done different things with it. It was more electrical and I gained weight, but man, for four months, I was really clear and, oh, in alignment, you know, it's like, oh, this is how it feels. But anyway, enough of that. So yeah, I love doing the, the one woman show. And, you know, I always fought the fact that I had a voice. And I didn't want to use it. But in my older years, I realized that that was an asset to me, plus my, my book writing. So I'm, I'm very grateful. I had a lot of talent. I kind of squandered some of it. But it won't be the finish of my little interview or my little speech until I talk about how I feel about Princess Leia. I feel like I may have heard once or twice while you were still living. <laughs> well, do you still feel the same way? <laughs> I'm different. I have, I've always had a love hate feeling about it. You know, it brought me into a wonderful field in Hollywood, but I was so self-destructive. I couldn't even, I couldn't even honor the gift I had because I was so young. And so I just really didn't fully embrace it. I did in certain junkets when they were, you know, uh, talking about, the show and we had to promote the movies and such. But I realized later in life, when I saw it go through generations, how my character, whether it was right or wrong, was so profound in how it affected so many young people. And so I got over myself. And then I got to the point where I have experienced realms that are like star wars and realized that it wasn't so much fantasy as we thought that there's so much of life in the galaxy or the greater reality that is in that series of movies and i'm really kind of tired of all of the offshoots just to keep it alive but if it keeps it alive in people's thought systems, maybe they'll bring it in a little better and help out a little more. When I also realized that my my donuts were modeled on the Hopi women, and they're considered the most spiritual of all the Native Americans, I finally got, oh, okay, so George really knew what he was doing besides putting me in a bikini? And so I just kind of have morphed it into my own belief system and and honor now the effects that it's had on everyone and and everything and i'm i'm pretty okay with it now let me just say to you i must confess in the 1970s i had the princess leia crush um, that so many young boys probably did well i wasn't that young of a boy at that point it was on but I had come to read some things by you, some articles, and see you in other capacities. And I'd come to uh, gain such a great respect for your intellect. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the gifts that you brought. And um, yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, you know, I, I've had so many men tell me how they loved my character but it never ever fed a good man to me i never found a good man with all that notoriety you know I, carrie was always looking for someone who wasn't her dad so yeah there's that but that's okay too i have to tell you how much i appreciate what a great comedian you were and you were an integral character in my son's favorite film, which was the Blues Brothers. Oh, my God. And so we're grateful for 
all of the incredible characters oh. that you played. <laughs> well, those are my really stoner years. <laughs> I was hanging out with Belushi and Dan Aykroyd and so many of the SNL guys and and it, but it was so much fun because we would, could be so wild and crazy and we were young and and restless and stupid and it, and it was wonderful but I have a quote that Jean's daughter uses quite a bit and sent to her recently you know you have to have a great sense of humor about everything because if it wasn't funny then what's the point and uh I, I had to I had to do that you know one of the things that I wrote through Jean earlier when they were putting cosmic voices together was my a Christmas greeting and if you haven't read it go back because that I thought I really relayed my essence about Carrie living the wildlife in in the galaxy and um I was given so much like so many, I couldn't really accept all the accolades because I wasn't feeling very centered in myself. And I felt like, um, what does they call it? A uh, When you feel like it's a false gift, um, I can't think of the word right now, but, or Jeannie can't, but you know, you, you don't, I don't deserve that. You know, it's a lie. I'm, 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 I'm stealing, you know, I had a hard time accepting, even though genetically I knew how close it was, I just, I had a difficult time and I was so young. I mean, I was 17 when I was working with Warren Beatty and oh my God, the stuff that went on in the studios, <sighs> drugs, sex and rock and roll. And I was ready for all of it, you know, give it to me. I'm just grateful I didn't get really sick or pregnant or both. But who's to say that maybe I hadn't been? Anyway, that's my my news. But I I I am so amazed at the brilliance of this amazing realm of energy and and life and people. And I am just I'm just this old burned out stoner chick who is just riding the wave. And just having a great time learning all these new things. And I even had a chance to talk really good French with Jeannie's mom because she was a brilliant French teacher. You wouldn't, her accent was impeccable. And so we had conversations. And I've not told Jean this either, but we talked about her a lot because her mother was a little hard pressed to understand her daughter's gifts. But anyway, um, there's just so much to learn and it's just so incredibly amazing. And all I would say to anybody who's listening to this today, don't miss a thing. Don't run away when the goodness knocks on the door. Even if it's just a butterfly flying by your window or a friend bringing over a nice bottle of wine and you don't have a problem with it, or you have another person that says, let's go get barbecue, even if you're a vegan. Don't miss a thing. Don't miss a thing. Stay focused on something beautiful. Yeah, you'll get there maybe five or 10 minutes late. But what the hell difference does it make? You're never going to die. So why don't you enjoy where you are? You're never, ever going to cease to exist. So just enjoy where your feet are planted. I can't say it enough. We have such anxiety and I didn't do this right. What if I don't do this right? And maybe the person's judging me and it's all just so much bullshit. So just inspiring people to be kind, but be kind to yourself, be kind to others. You know, make good choices. But if you don't make a good choice once in a while, then forgive yourself. You're learning. You're human. This is a really fucked up place to be. And if you come here, you want to learn some big shit. That's all I can say. So... I'm not going to pardon my French because my French is very good. Thank you. But I think I've taken long enough. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> I, I just want to really thank you for your contribution when you were here and your contribution now. And it's nice to see the growth that's taking place within you uh, from that perspective. So thank you so much for being with us. Be sure to join us for part two of this fascinating interview.
If you enjoyed this content, please hit like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.